to thank Sergeant Aaron Ellis for joining us to talk about really kind of an important, we, we hope and probably most of us will never have to yes. be engaged in such a thing. But if it is, wouldn't it be good to know that you've had a little training and kind of know what you, to expect and what you need to think about. So thank you. Thank you. Sergeant Ellis, we appreciate it. And I'll leave it to you now. Thank you. Um, like Maureen said, um, I'm Aaron Ellis. I'm from the police department. I have, um, I'm blessed to have a really fun job down at the police department. I'm our community uh, service outreach director. So um, I get to come out and do these sort of presentations. Uh, I work with the school district. Uh, I supervise the school officers, which is one of the best jobs that I think you can have. Um, just talking to a teen over here from JTV, I did a presentation at uh, her church last night. So uh, we get asked to do these quite often. Uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we really focused on active shooter incidents in the schools. Uh, as you will see during my presentation, the, the focus of these incidents has actually shifted more to the public sector and uh, to the, the commerce area of our, of our country. So um, had a meeting yesterday with the Janesville Gazette. They're putting a safety plan together. We have another one with a, another business here in town next week. So we're getting a lot of requests for these, which is refreshing to me uh, because people are thinking about this. It can happen. Um, unfortunately, it will happen in our area at some point, and it has happened uh, as near as uh, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, Brookfield, Wisconsin. We've had these sort of incidents. So um, I will move on with the slideshow. I like feedback, so if at any time you have any questions, you want to stop me, uh, this is really just kind of a guide to where we're going to go, but uh, please feel free to ask me if you have any questions. Let's talk about what an active shooter is, and this is kind of a, a tricky thing. Um, it depends on who you ask for the definition. So um, the FBI may have a different definition than the ATF. The ATF may have a different definition than uh, the CIA, whatever agency out there is defining it. Um, what we can tell you is it's an individual or a group, doesn't have to be just one person, that's actively engaging in killing or attempting to kill people. Does it have to be a firearm? No, right? Um, we've seen incidents uh, not only in our country, especially overseas, uh, where there's been explosives that have been used, where vehicles have been used. In London, they you know, smashed a van into a group of people. Uh, so it does not have to be, but it usually, especially in our country, has been a firearm. Um, active shooters, I can tell you, they don't generally intend to survive. Uh, they are either going to commit suicide, be taken out by the police, or even more likely be taken out by a civilian in an incident like this. Uh, they're not there to negotiate. Many active shooters have studied previous incidents. So what's the big one when we think of active shooter incidents in our country? Does anyone remember? What's that? Las Vegas, Las Vegas is the most recent and the largest. Um, what kind of got us on this page, though, was Columbine, 1999. Uh, Columbine was a school incident. Um, Vegas will go down as one of the largest, if not the largest ever, and it's probably the one that this current generation will always remember. Um, my generation will remember Columbine. Um, I had just started as a police officer in 1999, so I'll never forget that day. Uh, who do we use uh, as our guide to train our officers, and the answer is uh, the alert group, and that's the advanced law enforcement rapid response uh, training. Uh, the alert group was started by Texas State University. Uh, they are in cahoots with the FBI. I'll tell you, this agency provides us with free training to law enforcement. Uh, they are constantly updating policies, procedures, and studying these incidents. Uh, they are heroes in my mind, um, and, and we follow their principles, which are run, hide, and fight, and those, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now there's other groups out there, and they're great groups, they do great work. There's something called the Alice Institute. Uh, they have a model called avoid, deny, and defend. It's really similar to run, hide, fight, right? Um, the difference between the Alice Institute and the Alert Institute is they charge you to get trained by them. So uh, being a government agency, 
uh, alert is a little more kind to our pocketbook. And uh, that's what we've stuck with. Uh, we've gotten some great training from them. I'm one of seven officers on our department that has alert certification. Um, so you say, well, what, what does that do? We train the officers not only of our department but of other agencies across our county um, on how we're going to respond to an incident like this. In fact, Monday uh, morning, starting at 4 a.m., I will be at Craig High School, and we're not going to leave there until 4 in the afternoon. Tuesday, that same training group is going to be back at 4 a.m., and we'll leave again at 4 o'clock that afternoon. That way we can get third shift officers, second shift officers, and day shift officers through our training. We do this three to four times a year. Um, not only do we invite the Janesville Police Department to this training, we invite Rock County Sheriff's Department, Beloit, Edgerton, Evansville, Milton, uh, Clinton. The DNR uh, shows up. State Patrol will show up. Because if an incident happens in our community, we're all coming, and we need to be on the same page. So well-known events in our country, uh, they all have some significance. There's many more. I just listed a few. Uh, we've already mentioned Columbine. The big thing that changed Columbine was law enforcement's response to these events. Uh, so what I mean by that is when I was trained as a brand new officer in 1999 and we were called to an incident where there might be someone that was armed inside of a building that was actively shooting uh, what were we trained to do as a patrol officer? And the answer is, we were trained to get there, stage outside, and wait for the SWAT team. And that's exactly what that agency did. They did exactly as they were trained. There were people that died inside that didn't need to, but it's not the fault of those officers. They did what they were trained to do. Where this incident occurred, it's a very similar size uh, community as Janesville. Um, so they had trained SWAT officers, just like we do. They had a SWAT team. But does that SWAT team work 24 hours a day? Are they out roaming around in an armored vehicle, all geared up, ready to go? And the answer is no. Anyone come to our national night out this week? Or have you been there? Hina was there. Uh, we have an armored vehicle that we share with Bloit in the Sheriff's Department. And uh, we all have SWAT teams. And we all have a lot of special training on those SWAT teams. The problem is, is the officers that operate that vehicle and that are on that SWAT team, they have another job Monday through Friday. They might be a patrol sergeant. They might be a school officer over at Franklin Middle School. Uh, they might be a detective. We can't afford to have officers just specially trained and designated right to the SWAT team. So lesson learned from Columbine, we couldn't sit and wait. We sat and waited and people died. And why did they die? They died because they bled out, because officers didn't go in and attack the problem. Um, that was the big one that changed law enforcement. Oh, do I have it on there? Uh, there's an incident that occurred in Aurora, Colorado uh, a few years ago. And it occurred in a movie theater. And that incident uh, will go down as changing the way that fire departments respond to these incidents. And you say, why? Uh, for those of you, maybe you listen to a police scanner once in a while. What did you always hear the police department say on a radio when they were sent to an incident with the police? Does anyone know? There you go. They were staging, waiting for the violence to stop until the police told them it was clear and safe to come in. What's the problem with that in an incident like this? We don't have time, right? Uh, if you've studied military warfare, you studied these incidents, you don't die from the gunshot, you die because you bleed out. And the fire department had the special skills and the training to save lives. And they realized, we need to get in as quick as we can. Um, you should be proud that your area where you live right now, whether it's you live in Beloit, Janesville, Milton, wherever you live, our fire departments here have committed um, to something called Rescue Task Force. And Rescue Task Force is a group that works with the police department that we're going to make sure that we get paramedics into the scene of an incident like this as quickly as possible, uh, when we make it warm or safe. Um, it uh, doesn't have to be totally free of gunfire. It doesn't have to be totally quiet. If we can get the fire department in and we can gear them up with some safety equipment to keep them safe, 
they're going to get in and they're going to find a spot to start treating patients that are inside. Because if we can stop the bleeding, we can save lives. Some of the other ones that are on here, uh, some are more recent. It goes to show these things can happen anywhere. They can occur on Indian reservations. They can occur on college campuses. What's scary about this one? An elementary school, Sandy Hook Elementary, right? Uh, Oak Creek Sikh Temple. So I talked to Tina about that before. These things are happening in churches. Not only are they happening in places of worship, that's right here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Orlando Nightclub, huge one. You know, focused on gay men that were there at the establishment. Mandalay Bay. Who thought that they were going to a country concert to get shot at from a 30-second window? No way, right? So that, that's a real eye-opener for us, that these things can happen, not only happen in our country, they can happen in probably one of the safest cities in the United States. Where do they have more surveillance cameras and police officers and you know, security guards than in a huge casino. So, and then, you know, the more, another more recent one, Douglas Stoneman uh, High School in Parkland. How will that change law enforcement? That's the focus of our training next week. We're going to train on entering as a one officer entry. You know, we have trained now for years, ideally, three to four officers enter at the same time. You have a team, you form a diamond, and you, and you go through and you, you clear the building can't do that. We can't wait for a partner. We're going to have to get right in. So that'll be the focus of our training. All right, we're going to try this. I think it was here. Just a second. And let's take a look back. It was supposed to be just another school day at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. What happened there on April 20th, 1999, however, has gone down in history as one of the nation's worst criminal acts. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold unleashed their fury at the world when on that Tuesday they entered school grounds and went on a 49-minute rampage that left 15 people dead and 23 others wounded. The violence began outside of the building where they shot classmates out eating lunch. They roamed the halls in the cafeteria, setting off bombs and shooting indiscriminately. Most of the carnage, though, took place in the library. There, the 18-year-old Harris and the 17-year-old Klebold taunted students who hid under desks. They shot some at point-blank range and killed others by shooting randomly under tables. One survivor who was badly injured was able to crawl out a window where SWAT team members carried him to safety. It would become one of the most indelible images of that day. Outside the school, chaos reigned as students and faculty were let out by police with their hands up. They then sprinted to friends and loved ones for emotional reunions. Back inside, Klebold and Harris, who'd killed 12 classmates and a teacher, committed suicide, though it would be the next day before authorities deemed the school safe for others to enter. By then, a makeshift memorial of crosses had sprung up in the school's name had become synonymous with violence. Jackie Bashera, The Associated Press. So 19 years ago already. So where do these incidents occur? And a lot of times when I start this presentation, uh, whether it's at a place of commerce, it's a public event like this, or maybe at a school, um, I'll say where do these incidents occur and, and what do most people say? Schools, yep. And I'm going to show you two things. This is an old slide. This is 2014. There's another one right after it that's from 2016. Schools are 29% at the time. Um, business, 40%. In the last couple of years, two, three years, that's even changed even more. Um, the good news is schools, the numbers are going down, which is fantastic. Um, the bad news is businesses, places of worship, uh, outside venues, they're on the rise. Um, so a lot of times when we think of these incidents, we automatically think of, we go back to that Columbine. Uh, it's the one that's in our mind. It's the one that changed our country, really, if, if you ask my opinion. Um, what else, what's another reason why we think of schools? What do, what do we see every time we turn on the TV? 
right? The media, and the media sells this as these are where these incidents occur. When in fact, there's some scary stats out there, but these sort of incidents happen almost every day in our country. We don't even hear about them. We've become so numb to them now. Uh, we don't hear about when someone at a factory in California goes off and shoots three, you know, coworkers. It doesn't, because because the media doesn't care, and, and it's not it's not shocking to us anymore. Um, so we'll talk about that a little more, but um, really want to press some of these numbers. So here's the most recent stats. FBI just came out with these. Uh, they went back to 2016. Um, so now look, commerce, 43.2%. Education, though, we're down to 21%. We're making improvement. Uh, open spaces. Before Mandalay Bay, I saw some of these pie charts, and I thought, what the heck does that mean? Well, it's things like that. Concert venues, athletic events, uh, places where large people gather because they're target rich. Uh, government institutions. We've had some occur at military bases of all places, right? Couple. Uh, healthcare facilities, 2.7%. Now, how scary is that? We did a, uh, a talk and uh, some drills with Mercy Hospital a couple years ago. What are we going to do? We can't move some of those people. Our, our big push is run, hide, fight. A lot of people there can't run. They're stuck. Um, so hospitals have come up with some additional security measures. Did you have a question? The question that I'm wondering is if the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators, have changed either by category, age, circumstance. Yes, um, in a way. So the, some of the old stats that were out there from the early 2000s, the, the age was 14, 15 to 19 was the average. Um, the shift we've seen in the average age now is 19 to uh, early 20s. So, yes, in, in a way that, that has happened. So that's a good question. Uh, talk about some school-specific things. So some of the observations. Number of active shooters in schools. Uh, it's remained somewhat steady. Um, but, like I said, in the last few years, we've seen the decrease, which is a good thing. Um, how about where these are occurring at schools? High school is still the highest, 22 of the incidents. 15 were in institutions of higher education, so at college campuses. Uh, six, six at middle schools, about six at elementary, and three other, whatever that would be. Um, so... The, it has stayed somewhat uh, steady, like I said. Um, there's been an increase, though, at, at schools of higher education, at college campuses. Uh, we had one right here in our area, Northern Illinois University. Um, so these things are occurring at places where we're still not expecting them to occur. Um, if you look, another thing that I found interesting with some of the ones that have occurred at schools, resolution of incident. So what did I say earlier? I said most... Most of these incidents end in shooter suicide or uh, they're killed by, you know, a civilian or the police. When they happen at schools, more than half, they're apprehended by law enforcement, so they're surrendering. Younger suspect, um, you know, a lot of fear there. So that, that, I thought that was an interesting slide, too. This is a stat back from 2015. I mentioned earlier how frequent these things happen. So this is in the United States. It's a mass shooting where there were four or more victims, including the shooter, any day of the year in 2015. 334 in the 351 days they study. Every single day. There are websites out there that you can go on, Shot Tracker, and you can look up any given day of the year 2018, and I almost guarantee you there will be an incident somewhere in our country. Some days there's two or three, and we get a day off the next day. But uh, that's how frequent these things are happening. Do you hear about all those? I don't. Yeah. And I follow this stuff. Yes, sir. It seems to me of newspapers, the media in general, would highlight how often it happens and how much active shooter training would help, more people would do it. You might be right. So, so his 
statement question is if we continue to highlight these things, are we going to have copycat incidents, correct? Not copycat, but are we going to have more people getting training to say it could happen in my community? Uh, oh, or, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's always a copycat, but I don't know if the general public knows that this is. They're always great. figuring it's like seatbelts. <laughs> they don't wear them because they say it's going to happen to the other guy. And what, wearing a seatbelt is the surest way you're going to walk away from an accident alive. Yes, sir. If you don't have a seatbelt, I can tell you lots of people, and it says it right in the paper, they were not wearing a seatbelt. It rolls over on them, you know, some injury. But, yeah, I don't want to encourage copycat. And I always worry when the media highlights that. But I wish more people would realize how they need to. Yeah. And, and, and I think we're, it's a double-edged sword. I, <laughs> you're right. I want more people to show up for a class like this when we have it at the public library. Um, I want more people to understand these things happen all the time. I want more businesses in our community to reach out to us and say, what can we do to make our employees safer? Um, on the same token, I, I am one that believes at some point when we sell this thing over and over and over again, and it's 24 hours a day coverage on CNN, HLN, Fox News, whatever one you watch, right? And an incident happens, and that's all you see for three days. Most of these incidents, uh, if, if you've studied them, um, the folks that have written books about them, they say these, this is their, their life, these people that do this, and they study these incidents, and they get to a point where um, you know, they're trying to outsmart the cops. What happened in Parkland, Florida on the last one? What did they do to get kids out in the hallways? Anyone know? He came in at the end of the day yep. when the doors were not locked anymore. Yep. And what else did he do? He pulled the fire alarm. Oh, yeah. Because what have we trained kids to do nine times a year for their entire school career? Fire alarm goes off, you line up at the door, and you march out like little soldiers, right? we got to start thinking about that. So the next day, what did we do with the Janesville School District and the Milton School District? We called and said, do you realize what happened here? Uh, we need to think about this. Another thing, we, we did some research the next day. How many times has a, a student in the United States died in a fire recently? 1958, I believe, was the last time that we've lost a student in a fire, and it was because of some sort of a boiler explosion. We don't die in brick buildings where we're all awake when we're there and, and the fire starts, right? We get out. So we train, and there's nothing wrong with training fire. I don't want it to sound like that, but we train nine times a year to do a fire drill. We might train for an active shooter incident one or two times a year. Um, we need to make that mandatory because kids are dying in active shooter incidents in our schools. Um, so that, that's something that's near and dear to me, and we're really going to keep pushing for Before we, oh, so, so the question is, what are we going to change about fire drills? Um, and the answer is, are we in a huge hurry to get out just because the fire alarm goes off? Because what did I say the school's made of? What are, what are all schools made of? Brick and mortar, right? So what do we need to do? What, what are we taught to do? Look, listen, smell, right? So we'll, we might come to the door, the teacher might come to the door. Is there really a fire out there? Do I see smoke? Do I smell smoke? Do I feel heat? If not, do we have time? Yeah, we probably have time to get out. So it's just putting that, that in the back of your head. We might not want to rush right out anymore. We, we might need to think because somebody figured out, hey, they've been trained to do this their entire school career. If I pull the fire alarm, they're going to march out in the hallway and become just a huge target, right? Using the PA system, um, yeah, the, the schools have PA systems. They use, you know, recognizable, uh, whether it's the principal, vice principal, maybe a dean of students we have in our district. Um, they have things that they do that make themselves recognizable, and, and the teachers and the students know when they need to do stuff. Our kids in our school district, it is amazing how good they are at these drills whether it's a fire drill or it's an active shooter drill. Um, they've done this their whole life, though. 
they're better at it than any adult is. I can tell you that right now. It's, it's crazy how good they are at it, how they understand. Yeah, these things happen, and we need to be trained on it. So um, even at the high school, it's a, to me, you know, you'd think there'd be some goofing around in that. They take it serious, and they really do these things, which is a good thing. So let's talk about response time. Um, this goes back again to Columbine. It goes back to why I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, these incidents are over in three, four, five, maybe six minutes. How long do you think it takes the Janesville Police Department to get you an emergency call? That long or longer? Yep. Um, I think on average, a uh, priority one emergency call around three minutes. Um, think about it. James is a pretty big city. On any given day, we might have eight, maybe nine or ten officers that are actually out in a squad car patrolling. Now, during the daytime, you get people in offices like myself, the administration, detectives. Um, so the numbers go up a little bit. But on average, eight or nine people to cover this big area, it takes us a while to get there. And, the, and there's a couple things that go good with that. That's why we train with other agencies. Because if this happens in Milton, I'm going. If I'm out and about, and I'm close. Even if I'm in my office, I'm getting in a car and I'm going. Because we've trained with them. I have kids that go to school in Milton. I'm going to Milton. You're not going to stop me. Floyd's coming. State Patrol is going to jump off the interstate and come. So that's why we train together, because we have to know each other's tactics. We have to be on the same page. Um, with that being said, we need you as a civilian as someone in the workforce to buy time. And we need you to have options. And that's why we talk about running, hiding, and fighting. So we'll get to those. Slide I found, uh, did some research on my own. I call it the stopwatch of death. So active shooters have become more focused on killing within a compressed time frame. Uh, Texas uh, Tower incident. Way back in the 60s, long before I was born, right? There's a bolt action rifle, and it takes a long time for him to sit up, pick out his victims, and fire down. One shot every two minutes he fired. Columbine, what were they using? Mostly handguns, shotguns. They had some improvised explosives, right? It averaged to 2.1 shots per minute. Now, there were times when they were firing more than that, but then they might march around the building a little bit, find more victims. Virginia Tech, he's in a, uh, your typical college campus building, like a hall, they, they call it. I believe it was some sort of a math classes that were going on. Um, there's like 10 to 15 kids in each room. It's an advanced type class. And he's going classroom to classroom. 7.9 shots per minute, mostly using a handgun. Well, what the heck happens here? Now we get down to Mandalay Bay. 83.3 shots per minute. More than one round being ejected from those rifles every second. And, and that's what, it's, it's insane, I think someone just said, right? Um, it's the modern day weaponry though, right? So we have automatic rifles. Not only do we have automatic rifles, he's got the bump stocks, they call it, something that can make it more rapidly fire. He has multiple weapons. Um, he's got multiple weapons set up in the corner of that building so he can move from weapon to weapon to weapon, right? That, that's scary. How is he able to get set up without anyone noticing? That's a great question. <laughs> They've been asking that. Because we've, that's what we talked about. What, what can you think of in our country other than maybe an airport or I don't even know what else? That's, that should be more safe than a, a casino, right? You go to a casino, look around. What do you see everywhere? Cameras, right? You have tons of security. A lot of that security is former law enforcement, former military, former FBI, whatever. Um, he had to make, I, I don't, I've seen, there's numbers out there, how, how many trips he made in and out of that building. It's crazy. And no one thought to ask. No one. Do you think people knew? I, 
Did his girlfriend or wife know? I, I'd have to argue yes. Yeah, somebody. Yeah. Oh, he'd been a regular too. Somebody who yep. doesn't come in, they may be more casual. They're just, hey, Mr. Stone, so how are you yeah. today? You know, yeah. Yeah. not really thinking. That's, that's a great point. Um, so, yeah, he's a regular. Uh, he spent a lot of money there, it sounds like. Um, did they become lax? Yeah. Are they going to admit that, though? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so we want to talk about option-based response. This is, this is where we're getting to to keep you safer. Um, lock and hold drills, I talked about that earlier. That was what we did when we responded to Columbine. That's what we taught the students to do was you get in a classroom. If that's the door, you get to the opposite corner of that door. You get down, you huddle down just like you would for a... A uh, tornado drill, a fire, you know, something that you're not going to leave for. Um, you get away from it, you darken the room, you stay away from windows, and you hide. That doesn't work anymore. Shooters have become more ruthless. What happened in Sandy Hook? They hid in a closet of some sort with the teacher. The shooter came and started shooting through the door. It was fish in a barrel. He had nowhere to go, right? So we didn't give options to those students to move. Um, we want to provide you, whether it's your coworker, you know, you're out in uh, public at a movie theater, you're at the library, we want you to have options to deal with an intruder. Um, our goal is to, to us, I'm sorry, develop a survival mindset. Um, we think that can, is a life skill that can be taught. So we'll talk about some of these things. These are our options. Run, hide, fight. Those are your three options. Now, do they have to be used in a particular order? Nope. What if someone was in here right now and we had information they were right on the other side of this wall over in the, the youth section? Do we have an option to run? Maybe. Um, you know, I see there are some exits and other places here, but what if we couldn't? What if those exit doors didn't serve, you know, they, they didn't exist? And we came to a conclusion, some of you that work here said, we don't have a whole lot of options, we have to hide, right? And so maybe we are able to darken this, barricade that door and hide. Now we get information, the shooter has moved to the lower parking area. Now what's our best option? Get away. So now we're gonna run. So our, our op they, they are ever evolving. It could start with run being your best option. It could start with hiding being your best option. It may start with fighting. In our opinion, those are the three best options. Now, if I had to choose one, it's run, because I want to get away from the violence, right? So that's, that's the one that we're going to recommend <laughs> if, it, if it exists. Um, your survival will depend on if you have a plan. So what do I mean by that? When you go into... Your, let's say uh, you're, you work still and you go into your work cubicle. Um, do you know what you have in your work cubicle that you could use to defend yourself? Probably not, right? <laughs> do you have fire extinguisher right by you? Do you have scissors? Um, think about those sort of things. Um, you know, look around this room. Oh, right there, fire extinguisher. We got a coffee pot. Uh, we have chairs. We have tables that we could barricade that door. Those are things that you have to start thinking about. Whether it's when you go out to dinner and you're at a restaurant, think about where you sit. Can you see the door? You know, who's coming in? I, I don't want you to live paranoid. Um, I don't want to live that way either. But just having a plan. Um, do you have safety things in your car? Do you have a tourniquet in your car? Do you have gauze? Um, start thinking about those things because not only could you help yourself, you could help other people, too. I'm thinking about things that we thought about already in the past, such mm -hmm. as if you're on an airplane, where's the exit? So yeah. if there's smoke, or if you go to a hotel, how many doors are you to the stairway down? It is or elevator or Because right. yeah. we've done that. So this is just an extension. It's taking it, it everywhere is. you go. It's an extension of something that we've done every time we got on an airplane, but we never think about in our own personal life. Um, I, I can tell you, and I work in law enforcement, so I think about these things, but there's definitely things I've changed over the course of my life as far as what I carry in my car. What, you know, I, I put a, I bought a ski boat recently. 
And I have young kids, and they ski and they wakeboard and that. I put a tourniquet in my boat. Because what happens if one of them you know, gets hurt, gets seriously cut? I might be able to save a limb, or I might be able to save their life if they're bleeding, right? Most people have a tourniquet on their boat. Probably not. People probably think I'm crazy, but who knows, right? Uh, th there are so many examples we can talk about. So let's talk about run, hide, fight. Um, don't be passive. Don't stop and take no action and freeze. Get the heck out if you're facing a, a deadly face uh, threat. Um, a moving person, anyone a hunter here? Have you ever hunted? No? Yeah? yeah. I don't shoot. Okay. But so is a deer that's running through the woods or a deer that's just standing on the prairie easier or harder to shoot? Running, right? Look at military things too. Is a target that's moving easier to shoot or is one that's, that's static? Um, so that's something to think about. It's not easy to deliver a fatal shot from a, a gun, whether it's a handgun, rifle, whatever it might be, if the person's running away from you. Um, so we're giving ourselves a better option. When we talk about hide, um, there could be, and, and we, we've talked about this, there may be situations where running's not an option. Uh, we talked about the medical emergency, so you're at a hospital, and uh, you, know, you might work on the ICU, and you have people that can't move. That's not going to be an option. Or we're at a, a nursing home. There's people in there that are immobile. You can't move. Maybe the suspect's right outside the door. Running's not your best option at this point. It's hiding. Um, so lock, lock doors. Stay away from windows. Be vigilant of increasing threat. I should add on there, though, also, be vigilant of the chance to escape. Because what have we seen from almost every incident in our country? Someone comes to that door and now they can't get through it, do they have a lot of time to spare? And are they willing to, to waste a lot of time? No, they're going to try to move on and find the next easy target. So we, we hear something going on here. We're able to shut that door, secure it with tables, form some sort of a blockade. Are they going to waste a bunch of time to get in here and get the six or seven of us? Nope. They're going to move on to the next building where they have easy targets. Oh, <laughs> or a wall or whatever, are those shots going to come through? <laughs> well, the weaponry that we've seen nowadays, like the, the stuff that was used at Mandalay Bay, it's coming through those walls. Yep. I'm, I'm curious, has architects thought through, because I've thought about this since I got this training here, is my office downstairs, windows. Yeah. I'm sorry. If somebody walks down that hall, I'm stuck there, and there's nowhere to there's nowhere to hide. Yeah. And and I thought, you know, are they rethinking this idea of putting these big windows even here because of the windows? Yeah. It, it would be easy enough for them to break out that window and then get in if they want. And the answer is yes. We've seen that change, but unfortunately. A lot of the buildings that are out there right now, schools that were built 10, 15 years ago, what was the big thing then? It was open concept, right? Open con Look at Marshall Middle School in our own community. It's a, it's a big open concept with rooms that you can access from the next room, and they're, they're circular, and it's, you know, you can look down on the whole school from different areas, and the, the library walls don't go all the way up. They only go up partially. Uh, you know, those were things that, that was the way we were building things 15 years ago. Right. And so that, that has changed, and do architects consider that stuff now? Yeah, I think so. And there's some really neat things out there. There's, there's some new things out there. There's, uh, you can put a specialized film that 3M makes now on glass windows that uh, is shatterproof. Oh, um, really? It's expensive. <laughs> um, there's... Uh, mechanisms that you can place on a, a door like any of these that can prevent it from being opened or closed from the outside. In fact, um, after the Parkland, Florida incident, students and a tech ed teacher at Craig High School started producing things. They have made some amazing, absolutely amazing tools um, that they're hoping to get ready to market here. Um, go, go on the internet and search um, you know, door stops or whatever. It, there's a ton of things out there. 
Um, but here, right here in our own community, in our high school, some high school kids said, we can make something that can prevent that door from opening. And they can make pieces that prevent it from opening out or in. So they've developed all these different things. It's really neat to see they're thinking about this and they're trying these out. So fight. Some people laugh when we talk about this um, and think, I can't do this. Uh, and that's fine. Maybe you can't, but maybe someone else can that's in the room. And I, and I have an idea for those of you that say that you can't. Um, an armed intruder is actively in the building. Uh, we're assessing our options. We've denied the intruder. Unfortunately, maybe the intruder got through. Um, what are our only options? It's to fight back, right? So we've told you and, we, and we've, we've trained classrooms and teachers and that all these years to get to the opposite corner and uh, get away from the door. Well, what if it's an imminent that this person's gonna get through? Now we're asking, is there a group of students in here that might be willing to put up a fight if this person gets through? So maybe we line them up right here and what do they have in their hands? Fire extinguisher, coffee pot, that fan, a chair, right? And when that person opens the door, they're attacking. And then we're hoping that maybe they can overcome that person. They can disarm them. Um, the podium, right? Yep. So there are a ton of different things that we can do to, to be countermeasured. Now, there might be some people that are in the room that say, I can't do that. Okay, great. Then you know what? You're going to be ready with a medical kit. You're going to have a tourniquet ready. You're going to have gauze ready. And if we ask you to help, please help us, right? So NYPD study that came out, uh, this one was 2014. 46% uh, of incidents resolved by citizens physically confronting the shooter, only 6% by law enforcement. Wow. Why? Really? Yeah, and why? What, what did we talk about? Yep. Yeah. It might take law enforcement five, six minutes to get here, and this thing was over in three. So someone confronted a citizen, confronted the shooter. Sometimes the shooter took their own life, 40% of the time. 14% resolved without force, negotiated surrender. We've talked about how that's happened in some school incidents, right? 1% shooters fled. Now that one has probably changed in the last three, four years because we had, what, the Texas uh, church one. Um, he actually left in a vehicle and was followed by a, a civilian who ended up taking his life eventually. Um, and, and so we've seen a little more of that where someone has fled, but that was pretty rare. Uh, let's talk about the, the options again. Uh, running. I will go out on record and say, in my opinion, avoiding contact with a shooter is always your best option. Um, why the building scene's a murder scene. We've talked about that. Um, so do we have a way out? And we can't limit ourselves to just the main door. We have to think about that. And that's one of the things that we're talking about when we're preparing ourselves uh, to, be, to survive these incidents. So if we, at our office space, maybe at our home, at a restaurant we go into, what are my other options for exit? Are, is there a back way out? Is there a window I could get out? Um, the officer I did the training with yesterday, his wife's a teacher here in the school district, and he still says, sometime on a drill, when you're getting close to retirement, I want you to throw something out the window and start exiting your students out the window. But I'll get in trouble. He says, no, we've been telling you for all these years that might be your only option. And it, it has been the only option at some schools. Um, so... Let's, let's show the district, we're prepared. <laughs> and this is what we're gonna do. It, you know, we say that being silly, but is it true? It, that might be the best option out for schools. And we talk about that when we go into the classrooms and talk with the kids, and they get that. They understand that might be our only option. Hiding, um, we, and, and we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because we've talked about it. We talked about podiums, tables, things, and offices copy machines, you know, things that you can pile up in front of the door um, to make it more difficult to get in. At Virginia Tech, um, you had asked about people shooting through windows and doors and that. Um, 
Virginia Tech had a classroom that had, I believe, 10 students in it and a professor. Um, one of the things they did was they barricaded the door, they laid on their back, and they held items up against the door. That frustrated the shooter. He couldn't get in. He returned to that door a couple different times. He knew that he was on a time crunch. He probably hear sirens coming. He moved to other classrooms that he did get into and start to shoot people. Now, he did deliver some rounds at that door. It killed the professor who came up with the idea to block it off. But every one of those students either lived or got out a window even before this incident was over. So that, that professor had a plan, and he saved the lives of 10 students. So hide and barricade, again, might, might be an option. Some things to think about. Silencing your cell phone. Maybe someone in your group is the one that's providing information to the dispatcher. You can do that through silence, just leaving it open, because they're going to hear what's going on. What else can you do in Rock County? Text 911. Yep. So years ago, we started a program here uh, where you can text to 911, and the dispatcher can text back to you. The original intent in that was to help domestic violence victims. Yep. So they can't, maybe their, uh, their abuser is in the same home as them, and they feel that if he, generally, hears them say anything, it's going to make it worse. But maybe they get a chance to go into the bathroom, and they can text information to the dispatcher. But Okay, so I got my cell phone. It's on silent. I just turn it on. I mean, you have to open up, wake up the sure. screen. I go to messages, and then I do a new message. 911. And I just put in 911 and then hit send, okay. and it will go? Yes. And because of location, it knows where you are. It knows what 911 center to contact because our, our phones are very high tech in location. Right. We right. solve a lot of crimes because people don't realize that. That's true. <laughs> Thank you, but not, necessarily. not necessarily in other counties. Um, in, in this area, um, Milwaukee, and Milwaukee and Dane have that technology now too. Yep. So is it all of Rock County or just? Here? All Rock County, yep. So you will see that probably become federal law though, I would think. I think it will become federal law, and they'll make all, oh. all 911 centers, so all cell phone carriers. In, Rock County, even yeah. else in the country. In the boon, yep. And if there's cell phone tower, it'll go. Yep, it'll send a message. I just want to tell people that if you're not exactly sure how your cell phone works in that way, um, please contact our librarians, because they will walk you through anything, any question you have about any of your electronic um, gadgets that you have and carry around. So if you're not sure how to do that, dial that 911 or text the 911, they will kind of show you on your phone. Uh, another thing a lot of people don't know about cell phones, and hopefully your staff does here. If not, please share this. Um, an old phone, so every, what, two years you can get a new cell phone. Um, now they let you keep it, generally, a lot of times. Sometimes you trade them in. Um, you have an old cell phone that you don't use anymore. Uh, keep it charged and keep it in maybe your car. Or keep it in a drawer next to your bed if you don't keep your cell phone there when you go uh, to sleep at night. Because what can you do from any cell phone that ever had service? You can dial 911. Well, isn't it true that even if you don't have service for that phone, yes. it will work? Yes. So you've shut off service to this phone. Um, it still dials 911. It has to dial 911 still. You do not have to have service. As long as the batteries, yep. <laughs> and that's, that's where you might run in trouble. Um, I get cell phones from community members all of the time up in my office because we still, um, to this day, there's not a lot of people anymore, but some people don't have a cell phone. And we might have a domestic violence victim in our community um, that has no way to contact us if something bad happens. They're, they're throwaway now. We issue them to them, and if they need to contact us, now they've got a way to contact us. So we can. the only thing that they can do, though. Yep. 
yeah, they can't call their friends or family members or, or play video games on like my kids do, right? But they can call 911. Yep. So it's, it's a pretty neat thing. Uh, last thing we'll talk about, and just real briefly, but we've, we've mentioned some of these things, is fight. It may come to a point where you have no other option but to fight. Um, we've talked about using improvised weapons. So when you go back home today or you go back to your cubicle or wherever it might be, maybe you're stationed in the factory where you work, um, think about what you have. Do you have fire extinguishers? Do you have scissors? Um, this big fan over here. There's chairs. Um, what can we do if we have to defend ourselves? Um, and as the example shows, and, and there's, a, there's a video that they play for a lot of companies here in our country, um, working as a team. And that's what I talked about, lining up. We've practiced it now in the school. Lining up a group of students that are willing, usually in the high schools, that are willing to take action if they have to. Um, your life, you're in a life and death situation. What can you do? You can defend yourself. We don't have to talk about, do I have the right to do this? Heck yeah, you have the right to do it. You have the right to defend yourself. So if you're willing to and you're prepared and you've thought about these things, it may be your only option. Talked about what do we do if we have someone that maybe is not willing to do with that. And we have an awesome partnership with Mercy Hospital um, where we go out and do some training and we work with the schools. Maybe some people don't feel comfortable fighting, but what can you do? You can render first aid. Basic first aid is really easy to render. Yes, sir. Okay, my wife is a retired nurse. Mm -hmm. um, and I've given allergy shots because I had to give it to her. Okay. Oh, tourniquet can't be that hard to do. No. Nope. Uh, where can you buy them? Tourniquets can be bought right on the internet. Uh, you can probably buy them at Walgreens now. Um, <laughs> we order... Now, there's different types. Um, there are ones that are issued to law enforcement, to military, and they're called like a Cat T is a, is a common brand. Um, they're Cat T. It's, it's, a, it's a cat, like the animal T. Um, they're, they're complicated to some extent. Um, now, if you've used them a few times, you're fine. But um, the ones that we've recently been purchasing, the school district's been purchasing to put in these kits, it's nothing more than a rubber uh, type band that you're just going to keep wrapping and pulling and tightening and eventually you're going to tie off above the wound to stop the bleeding. Yeah. They're super, super easy to use. Anybody can use them. You can find those right at Walgreens or order them over the internet or you know whatever, Walmart. Um, they work great and they're cheap. They, they stay forever. Um, I, that's, that's what I put in my vehicle and in the boat. Um, because it's, like I said, it's something that's really easy to use and it's something that it's mobile, it's light, it doesn't take up much room, it could save a life. Um, other things you might want to consider putting in a kit, gauze. Uh, they sell something on the internet that is available commercially also, it's called quick clot. So you have a, a wound from a knife or a, sh a sharp wound, you dump this powder in there, coagulates and it stops the bleeding. It's really easy to use. Um, you don't need any medical training to do these things. What else can you use? You can use a belt. Um, you could wrap towels on someone, apply pressure, uh, saran wrap for a, a chest wound. There's, there's a million things that you could do that may give that person a chance and to keep them alive just long enough until we can get a doctor, a paramedic, an ambulance, whatever it might be there. Um, and here's the big thing. It gives you a psychological benefit. When a victim can help out other people, it gives them a psychological benefit. So maybe they can't fight, but hey, I can help save people's lives, which is just as important, if not more. So we get asked a lot when we do these, well, what is an active, how do I know if my neighbor's an active shooter? How do I know what this person looks like? The answer, I don't know. No the one knows. Could be sure, he's smiling. Yeah. So, so the answer is, like I said, we don't know. Law enforcement doesn't know. No matter what we do, 
it, it's impossible to some extent to come up with a profile. Now, are there characteristics? Sure, mostly male. You've noticed everyone I've talked about has been a man, right? Um, mostly white middle class. Sounds a lot like people that we live in, you know, may know right here in Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, age. This has changed, gone up and down, but majority 15 to 19, secondary group 35 to 44. Uh, latest shift is a little bit older, so like 17 to early 20s, I think I, we had mentioned. Uh, majority had an ongoing conflict with at least one of the shooting victims. A lot of times these things, especially, uh, you know, we talked about this with the church group yesterday. If we had an incident in Janesville, how do we think this might look? The answer is we don't really know. But I thought Officer O'Leary that I did the presentation with did a really good job saying, I think it will happen at a place kind of like this at a church, and it will start as a domestic incident um, where maybe he's mad at uh, her, and she's a, a parish member, and she's got a new boyfriend that she's at church with, and maybe his kids are there with at the, at the uh, service, and he shows up. And he decides, this is the day I'm going to do this. And uh, I tend to agree with him. I, I think if something like that happens, that's probably about the way it's going to go. Um, we think of, anyone remember the Anasazi Spa incident in Brookfield? So in, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's like a place where ladies go get their hair done or nails done and massages, whatever. Um, she... Uh, the intended victim, um, that was her boyfriend that was the suspect in that. And she was dating someone else, and he showed up on a Saturday when she was working, and he demanded to know where she was at. And it turns out, I want to say she was, like, outside the building or back with a client. He never found her. He found six other people that worked there, though. And they died because he was upset with her. Um, you know, we don't have mega concerts and uh, something like the Mandalay Bay. Now, I'm not saying something like that couldn't happen here, but I think if something like this is going to play out in our community, it's probably going to be domestic related. Most of our homicides, do we have much stranger on stranger homicide in Janesville? We don't even have many homicides. Um, it'll be someone that, that knows the person probably. You know, the, the, very, the first time I remember, of course, this would have been in the 60s, mm -hmm. Um, was several shootings in post offices. Oh, and it yeah. was that kind of thing. I mean, we all know what being going postal means. Yes. I'm not sure some of the younger people understand where that came from, but it became because so many shootings, people were walking in, they had gotten fired, or they were disgruntled employees, walking into their place of work, which was the post office, and shooting the place up. Yeah. And that happened several times in the late 60s, early 70s, I believe. Yeah, and uh, as you said, these incidents generally occur where? At places of commerce. So that's probably the big push and the reason that most of these requests that we're getting right now are from places of business. Uh, 40, what I say, 43% of these incidents that are occurring in the last few years it's at a place of business. So it is the disgruntled employee that's upset. Uh, good chance that that trend could keep up. Now, when you're talking about domestic violence, so yes. I used to work for shelter and actually I responded to individuals mm -hmm. that were in peril. And I remember, this is why I'm asking you, I remember going to a hospital, actually, for Swedish American. Okay. Um, no, always up St. Anthony. Anyway, this person's life was threatened by this a gang leader. He was determined to take her out. Um, so she had been shot and was recovering, but it, we had a security officer outside the door. I know when I was in there, I couldn't have my back to it because you never knew. Yeah. But I wonder, do you have uh, any relationship with the hospitals to have something in place in that kind of scenario? Yeah, it's, it's, and it's not uncommon um, that the police department has officers that spend their entire eight-hour shift on a suspect at the hospital, on a victim at the hospital. Okay. Um, I was just curious because I know when I went through that with that one, 
It was very serious. There yep. were a number of them that I thought that one specifically that yep. was he wanted to kill her. Yep, not not uncommon at all that uh, you know we have to station an officer at one of our hospitals. It, you know, I don't you know how how often some of you drive by the hospital, but uh, drive by where the ER entrance is on any given day, there's a police car there. Um, we could probably have an officer assigned full time to the hospital. Um, I can tell you that from when when I was a patrol officer. So yeah, um, what can we say about most of these people? Uh, they have this anti-hero persona, um, I guess. Uh, they feel they're collectors of injustice. Uh, they, you know, they feel that they're gonna carry profound hurt, they'll go ballistic. Time and time and time again, when these people have survived or maybe we've read their manuscripts or their diaries, that's the common theme that we've seen. They had some sort of pain whether it was depression, they've been bullied, and they've transferred their hurt onto others because of that. Um, so yeah, I can't, there's, there's not a law enforcement officer out there that can say, oh, that person's an active shooter. That, you know, I know it for sure. No, they don't, we don't know. Um, we know some, some things that statistically put them in different categories, but we don't know. Uh, got a little more time, we'll, we'll rush through a few of these things, but uh, another scary stat up here. 81% of the incidents that the Secret Service has studied that have happened in our country from 2000 to about 2016, someone else knew about it and no one said anything. And, and we mentioned that about uh, the Las Vegas one at Mandalay Bay. You can't tell me no one else knew. He, he compiled this huge stockpile of weapons. He had to buy ammunition for it. He sent his wife away to, what, visit her sister and gave her like $100,000 to go on vacation for the weekend. I don't have that kind of money. Maybe that was normal for them, but that's, that seems strange. Um, you know, and, and how could she not have known? Like he's packing up all these things to go gamble in Vegas. That just doesn't make sense, right? Um, and 59% of the incidents that have occurred in our country, more than one person had some knowledge of it. Um, so here, here's what we're asking. Um, if you know something, say something. See something, say something is, is a campaign that you've probably heard of. Um, we had a program, and we still do, we have a great Crime Stoppers program in our community. And from the time I was a little kid, I can still remember the commercials up until a few years ago. Um, you called 756-3636 if you wanted to report something anonymously. There's a problem with that now. Um, we talked about the, the age where a lot of this happens, and it's, you know, 15 to early 20s. Um, do kids use phones anymore? I have a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. I don't know that I ever hear them call somebody unless I force them. I hand them the phone and say, call your grandma, right? They don't talk on the phone. They send text messages. They use apps. Um, we recently hired an officer. And his field training officer came up to me because uh, that was part of our hiring process and said, this guy doesn't even know how to talk on the phone. I told him to call somebody and he says, I don't call people, I text them. Well, we can't do that <laughs> as a professional police officer, as a department, so we had to teach him. Uh, you gotta, you gotta call. Um, there's some smart people out there that said, we gotta come up with some other technology because phone calls just don't work anymore. We were down to about 25 tips on Crime Stoppers per month. Um, 154 the month of March. I think another presentation I did the other day, I updated September of uh, 18 and it's like 176. So we've you know, quadrupled, quintupled um, our average because of a new program we use called P3Tips, which is an app you load on your phone. You can send a text, you can send a picture, you can record, uh, I could record you sitting here saying something and I can load it and I can send it. It goes to, uh, it's in the 40s now, law enforcement officers right here in our area. So it might go to 10 people at the Janesville Police Department, a few at Beloit, some at the Sheriff's Department. Uh, it even goes to counselors at the high school if the tip is appropriate for them to see. And what it does, 
is it allows someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week to see this information. And if we need to act on it, we can act on it now. Um, so I'll give you some examples. When this first came out, the biggest unexpected effect we had on this was mental health related calls. Uh, about, now it depends on who you ask, st statistically, about one in four calls that we take are directly related to mental health at the Danesville Police Department. Um, someone who's in some sort of a mental crisis, needs our assistance because of mental illness. Now if you ask a patrol officer, I was with Tim O'Leary last night, he's been a patrol officer for 23 years, he said, I'd say it's eight out of 10 calls I take. Maybe it's the area he works. He works, a lot of his calls are on the west side, so he's at the hospital, he's at Parker High School, he's at Franklin Middle School. He says, no way, that's too low. It's about 80% of the calls. Um, so when we started getting these tips, we were getting them from students, maybe at the high school, and they said, hey, I've got this friend. Um, his mom and dad are going through a divorce and maybe dad just lost his job and he's, he's depressed. He wants to hurt himself, he wants to hurt other people. His girlfriend's breaking up with him. His life is in shambles right now and I'm afraid he's gonna do something stupid. Well, what does that allow us to do? The, the student who's reporting this doesn't feel comfortable confronting his friend. Um, maybe doesn't feel comfortable going right up to a teacher or a counselor at the school or the, the police resource officer at the school, but now he's, he feels good because he shared that information with 40 of us who now can make a decision, how are we gonna approach this student and how are we gonna handle this? Um, we're not gonna tell the student that the friend told us. You know, we're gonna make up something. Um, you know, hey, we're concerned about some things we heard that you said. Um, We've heard about some of the text messages that you sent friends. You know, maybe we noticed something in your writings in your schooling that um, we want to talk to you and we want to offer you help. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the student, it was, a, it was a cry for help. And whew, now I can talk to people about this. And it's amazing how much success we've had. I will argue with anyone. Uh, I can't put it on paper, but I can tell you we've saved kids' lives already. Um, that didn't commit suicide because we've confronted them or didn't do something stupid like go into a school and take out their pain on other students. So it's been awesome. That's my little sales pitch for P3. Um, we have pushed and pushed and pushed that thing at the middle schools and the high schools. Um, we're now pushing it through the public. Uh, what does P3 stand for? It's uh, P3 Tips. It's a company called Anderson software that puts it out. Um, it looks like the Facebook app almost, the symbol does. Um, I don't know what P3 means. Okay. Um, if it's the three owners of the company, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it's free to the public. It works fantastic and it's been a lifesaver for us. Yeah, I downloaded it. I was at Parker High School and I saw a sign. Yeah. Never used it, but I do feel better having it. Yeah. And it, it's, it's got so much cool technology. Like I said, if you have a camera on your phone and you take a picture, you can load that directly to your tip. Um, you can record a video. I, we could you know, record you and I talking. Um, you can take a screenshot, if you know how to do that, of a text message a friend sent you. Um, or you can forward it through there. And it, it's, it's fantastic technology. The kids know how to use it better than we do. Um, and it gets used all the time. That's the best part about it. Uh, that's the amount of information we get from it is unbelievable. Uh, so we talked about that. Uh, I, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, 2016, high 20%, almost a third. So almost 33% of our calls directly related to mental illness. Uh, that's a problem in our community. Um, we don't have enough resources. We recently, in my, uh, and right in my office, um, we have a part-time Rock County crisis worker that works right out of my office now. Uh, we gave her a cubicle, we gave her a computer, we gave her a phone, and she works right out of my office, and if a tip comes in in the city of Janesville, 
if we have an officer that's on a call that's dealing with someone in mental crisis, we throw her in a car and we take her right to the scene. It's awesome. Um, because one in every three of our calls was kind of going down that path, right? Um, so it's, it is awesome to have that resource and to have her that she can respond immediately. And that's what they're trained to do, is talk to people, put them in touch with the resources they need. If we have to detain them uh, for their own safety or the safety of others, she can make that call right there. And it's, uh, it's a great, great resource to have. Uh, we have uh, you know, some other things going on in our agency also, crisis intervention team. That's new in the last few years. We have a bunch of officers who are trained um, to deal with someone that's in some sort of a crisis situation. And the general trend across our country, and we might be a little bit ahead of the curve right now, is if you get sent to a call and someone's in some sort of a mental crisis, slow it down, take a breath. What do we know about this person? Uh, is anyone else in that house that might be at risk? Um, what can we do to avoid having some sort of a violent encounter with this person if we can talk them down and we can get the resources there to talk to them? We also have on our computers and our squads now, um, we have the ability to, if we've gone to a house and we've dealt with the same person. We've gone and we've dealt with uh, Jimmy and we know that if we say this to him, it's going to set him off. Um, or if we talk about this person, they're going to get really upset. But maybe if we talk about this person or we can call this family member, he's going to go from here to whew, real quick. So we have information that pops up. That person is flagged. And I know that doesn't sound good. It was the best way we could put it. Um, but it's information that's in there that's going to save their life and keep our officers safe. Um, and, and we can share that now with other agencies. That's a trend you're seeing a lot of departments go to. And it's working. So what's on the horizon? Uh, there's one more video at the end, but we'll just talk about a couple things. And I've mentioned most of this already. Rescue Task Force Agreement in Rock County. Our fire department, the Beloit Fire Department, the Milton Fire Department, anything that touches us um, has made an agreement with our police departments. We have equipped them with bulletproof vests. We have equipped them with ballistic helmets, right? This is embraced uh, throughout the United States because of the Colorado, Aurora, Colorado incident. Um, we're a little bit ahead of some other places because we're already training. Um, so we train together. Monday and Tuesday, fire departments, their rigs are going to start showing up one engine house at a time. And we go through and we train, how can we move you through this building? How can we get you to an area where we can train role players or or take role players, maybe we have our police explorer group come and they're our patients. And we drag them to a spot and now they can treat them there. Um, we're going to try to get you treatment within minutes if we have an incident like this. Uh, Mercy Hospital, MD1. If you're not familiar with that, that's the white suburban that rolls around town. There's white and blue. There's like three or four of them now. One of them lives right down the road from me. And she goes by lights and sirens about 100 times a day. Um, they. Uh, they are very highly trained medical doctors who are probably trauma surgeons or ER docs um, who have signed on to work on this program for you know, a designated time. And basically, they are mobile doctor units that go throughout our, our, uh, our county, Walworth County, and now down by Rockford because Mercy owns some hospitals down there. And they respond right to the scene of a crime. They respond right to the scene of an accident. Um, so if we have a serious accident, whoever's on duty, they're rolling around just like we are with a radio, and whew, they go straight to the scene. These Suburbans are so amazing. They can do surgery out of the back of them. Yep. Yep. It is, it's absolutely amazing um, what they can do. Mercy is very committed to this program. It's a national model that they're running. Um, the doctors are so committed to getting us additional training. Like I said, they really pushed to get these casualty care kits, these medical, basic medical kits in the classrooms and teach the students, you don't have to be afraid of this. It's really, they're really easy to use. 
and make them affordable, like three, four dollars a bag, I think, to the schools, um, to get them in the classrooms and have those things if they need them in the case of emergency. The other thing, um, we are constantly updating soft and hard lockdown drills uh, with the school district, and that's part of the video that I'll quick show in here in a second. Um, we are on, I think, on the forefront of that in keeping our schools up to date. My next goal with this program, we need to be practicing a lot more. Um, like I said, we do fire drills, and nothing against the fire department or doing fire drills, but we do those nine times a year, and nobody dies in fires in our schools. We need to do soft and hard lockdown drills and be prepared if this thing happens in our schools. What about in businesses? Does, has yes. any business started doing drills yes. yeah. about these kinds of yeah, things? Yeah, so Maureen wants to know if, uh, Businesses are doing this, and, and like I mentioned, um, really proud that some businesses are reaching out to us now. Uh, they want to have a plan if something bad happens in their business, and so they're, they're coming out and they're asking. Um, not only are they asking for that, but they're doing drills with us. Hey, can you bring your, some of your guys here someday and we'll run through a drill? Absolutely. Uh, you're, I see, I heard you're training at Craig High School next week on... Uh, Active shooter, well, we're closed on Saturdays. Do you want to use our facility to train there? And we've had some really cool offers to get into some buildings that we normally wouldn't get to train in. So the business community is buying into this. You made a great point earlier. We need more people to realize this stuff happens um, because then we'll get more people to at least have some basic knowledge. And hopefully you walk away today. You, you've got more knowledge on this than you did before you came. Do you have uh, anybody on the staff who will do audits for a not-for-profit or a church or whatever? So there's a group of us that, that does this training, and we come out, and one of the things that we generally start with, uh, kind of a three-pronged thing. Let us come to your business, to your group, uh, to your building, and let us do an assessment and make some um, suggestions. So yesterday was the Janesville Gazette. They had never had this happen. What happened? Was it in Baltimore recently? Someone attacked a, a newspaper facility. So they got thinking, holy cow, if that can happen here, man, people call here angry at us all the time. We need to have, we need to have an assessment. Um, so it was really, really productive. And for most of us, the three of us that had gone there, I've been in that building a few times, but I've been in the main lobby and shuttled to the elevator, to the radio, or um, maybe paid, you know, I was a paper boy when I was a kid. Maybe I paid, you know, or came down to pay my stuff or collect my paycheck. But other than that, you never had been past that front entrance. So it was really good for some of us even just to see that. And, you know, you know we'll get blueprints now and we'll put them on our computer. And that helps to some of the things that we think about. The other thing we can talk to them about is, you know, hey, this is what the school district's doing and the building's kind of similar. Do you have a a buzzer that you can buzz when guests come to the outside? Do you have a security camera that maybe is monitored by someone in here? Um, and the answer at most places is no, not really. Um, and so we, we talk about maybe some affordable options that they can take that can, uh, that can improve their security. So yes, always willing to do those things. Um, love doing them and that, that's really one of the things that we do a lot um, out of our office. So. I will get this to work. Where'd my mouse go? <laughs> there we go. I want to get to the last video, and we don't have to watch the entire um, video, but this gives you an idea. So to give you a little background on this, we run hard and soft lockdown drills at the Janesville School District at least um, two per year per building. There's 25 buildings in the Janesville School District. You might not realize that. Um, you know, we have two high schools, we have three middle schools, we have 12 elementary. Um, what else do we have, though? We have charter schools. We have, and there's like six of those now. There's the district office. Um, so there's a lot of buildings um, where a lot of people are at that sometimes we don't even think of some of these. And that's not even the private school. Right, yep. The Janesville School District, one of the biggest employers in our community. You gotta think about all the teachers are there. What else do we have? We have substitute teachers every day. So our problem was, you have all these different buildings. Yes, you have custodians, you have kitchen help. 
not everybody was on the same page. You might have one school where the uh, administrative staff does these drills three or four times a year. Another school might do them once. Um, even within a building, maybe one teacher knew that this is what you do if an emergency happens, but another didn't, didn't know that. So we wanted to come up with a unified, everybody in the district's gonna do it the same way. Um, here's a drop down chart, these are your options. And we started with staff. So last year in August, uh, when they went back that first week, we would go to all these uh, teacher meetings, we went to a big general one, and we showed this video. And then after we trained the staff, we trained the students. So we made it mandatory. Your first hour of this day, every class is going to do this video from high school to kindergarten. And then we shared it with the parents. And there were some parents that said, that should have been shared with me first. Well, you don't have to do it that way. You're not at school. The kids are. So that's why we chose that way. Um, so we shared it with all three groups. Um, we've shared it continuously since then. And um, we got the school district to agree that if they have someone that comes in as a sub, uh, they, maybe they're going to be a long-term sub, or maybe it's, this is part of your orientation. You go through this. So I think it's well done. We'll, we'll watch just a few minutes of it. I know that uh, my time's up, but um, it's available on YouTube. We share it with businesses and that now, too, because of the concepts. Um, we made it simple, and the concepts are all the same no matter where you're at. Hello, I'm Mike Madison, Assistant Principal at Marshall Middle School. As educators, safety is always on our minds. Families trust us to keep their children safe both physically and emotionally. Outside doors are locked, access is controlled at the front entrance of every building, all visitors check in and are provided with badges. We have an emergency response plan in every building and run drills to prepare for emergency situations. We collaborate with police and fire departments to provide a strong defense in the case of threats to our schools. We are trusted to keep children free from emotional abuse and trauma while under our care. We do this by addressing cruelty and harassment immediately and by teaching students through our own inclusive, respectful, and caring interactions with others. But safety is not just about students. Hello, I'm Jolene Taronis, Assistant Principal at Parker High School. Safety and security is the job of all staff members in each and every building in the district. Here are some general tips that everyone can keep in mind to ensure that all students, staff, and community members remain safe while in our care. Keep all external doors closed and locked. If you walk by a door that is propped open, re-secure it. If you find a door that is unlocked, call someone to lock it. Everyone in the building should have an ID badge or guest sticker that is visible. Guests must enter at a controlled entrance and sign in in order to receive a guest sticker. If you see someone in the hallway without a name tag or sticker, ask if they've had a chance to check into the office and then escort them there to sign in. Actively supervise students. Teach safe, responsible, and respectful behavior as part of your daily work with students. Whenever possible, include the safe and respectful use of technology. Be aware of your surroundings. If you see something or someone that doesn't look right, express your concerns to a building administrator. Each school in the district has access to a direct connect radio. In an absolute and worst case scenario situation, staff can use this radio to tap into the radio frequency of emergency services. Be assured that our police and emergency services will respond immediately. All district buildings have building emergency response plans. Review the plans for your building at least once a year or several times if necessary. If there is a need for the school to be placed in a lockdown situation, please keep the following tips in mind. A soft lockdown is initiated when there is a threat outside of the school building or when there is a need to limit staff and student traffic in the hallways, for example, during a medical emergency. A soft lockdown is initiated with an announcement over the PA system. Staff should scan the hallway for students or visitors, then lock and close the door. Class will remain in session and teachers can go on teaching. A soft lockdown ends when two recognizable voices make a joint announcement that the lockdown is over. A hard lockdown is initiated when there is an imminent threat inside or outside of the school building. A hard lockdown is initiated by an alarm sound over the PA system and ends only when two recognizable voices 
come over the PA system to announce that it has ended. When a hard lockdown is asked for, it's because of an immediate threat inside or outside the building, and staff and student safety is a major concern. And the priority here is getting everybody into a secure location inside their classroom, which would require possibly a teacher activating uh, the code themselves via their phone. Once the code is activated, the teacher's priority is to get their students into a corner of the classroom and to be quiet and that teacher, if they activated the um, hard lockdown, make sure that they call 911 to let the police know what is going on. If they cannot talk because they're fearful they might be heard, they can leave the line open and they can also text to the 911 center what is going on. Um, and here's where we ask students to be extra quiet and that we want to control cell phone usage to a minimum or none at all uh, so that all the lines can remain open and not be busy for emergency personnel that it will be arriving. Each building is gonna have a lockdown uh, tone and you're gonna to have to be familiar with each school's tone that you work in. Now, an administrator could also be putting the building into a hard lockdown and that would come over as an announcement and you would know that it's in a hard lockdown, but most likely it will be a tone. And once you hear the tone, you're gonna to need to proceed into the lockdown procedure, checking your hallways, make sure there's nobody out there, pull anybody in that might be out there, and then securing your own room and getting your kids into a, a corner of the room where they're gonna be quiet and you'll make other decisions from there. If you hear the door handle shake, please do not announce that you're in the building. It could be the um, intruder that's checking doors to see if they're open. Um, and if you acknowledge that you're in there, the intruder might work harder at getting into that room so please just wait until police officers come around and when they want to get into the room, they will have a master key to come into the room. They will not knock and ask you to come to the door. So do not open the door for anybody for any reason. Um, police will get into the door with a key. It's important for you to know each of the school's uh, code to put the building into a hard lockdown because depending on what building you're in, if you see an immediate threat to staff or students, you should be able to put that building into a hard lockdown um, to keep everybody else safe. If you hear the lockdown code in your building, you need to treat it as if it were real. If it were done by mistake or if it is a drill, it will be announced after it is over by the two recognizable voices and the announcement by your administration in that building. Every teacher should know their classroom. If you are a substitute for a day or you're a long-term substitute or that is your permanent classroom uh, or you move your class to a computer room or the library, you should always have an idea of what you would do in that situation, where you would put your students, where is the safest place to go for everybody. Uh, every situation and every room is going to be different, so you have to have some sort of plan wherever you are in the building. I won't make you watch the whole video but we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that we talked about. Uh, we talk about soft and hard lockdowns and what the difference is. Um, and, and we can use this, like I said, this can be used in uh, a private business, it can be used at a church, it can be used in a school. Um, we have put the schools into soft and hard lockdown in our community already. Um, who remembers the Jakubowski incident from last yeah. year, right? Right? So, um, that morning, we get information that uh, you know, we assisted with the investigation of a burglary to a gun store. Um, we've established some information about Mr. Jakubowski, um, what sort of car he might be operating. And we get some information that morning, uh, about five minutes before school starts over by Lincoln School, that a white male in a white four-door car has just put a gun uh, we have witnesses that say he picked up a gun from the terrace area and put it in the trunk of, that was an, uh oh, we're in big trouble moment, right? We have a school where kids are outside still and they're going into the school and we're in, well, uh, we weren't in panic because we practiced for this. So um, I immediately call, uh, you know, we, we call it in to the police department from um, the, the reporting persons, 
We make sure the school's immediately aware of it. I'm immediately on the phone with the admin downtown here, and we got to make some decisions really quick. Get every kid off that, put, put the school in lockdown, get them off the, um, the playground, and get them in the school until we can give you further instruction. And he, the car immediately goes mobile, and it's going out throughout town, and so we just make a call. Every school in the district is in hard lockdown. Nobody's leaving the classroom unless we feel there's an intruder in the, bit, in the building and we have to move. Um, the kids weren't allowed to uh, leave the classroom for lunch. Lunch was brought to the classroom. If they had to go to the bathroom, they had to be escorted by a teacher or a, an adult who stood outside the bathroom. There was no traffic going in those schools that entire day. Um, we felt we were keeping them safer being at the school than if we had kids running all over the community and out at the mall because we didn't know what he was capable of. And it turns out he had no intention of hurting any of those kids, it looks like, uh, at least we think. Um, and it turns out he probably wasn't even here anymore. He had already fled. But uh, that was a completely different uh, person that had nothing to do with the incident. There were just too many similarities. So that was uh, probably the longest hard lockdown that we ever imagined we'd be in, and it lasted for an entire day. Um, I'll give you another example. Just a few months ago, right before school was out, uh, Century Foods, a couple, elderly couple exits the, the food store and they're uh, robbed in the parking lot of his wallet and some other money. Um, he put up a little bit of a fight and the suspect fled on foot. Well, what do we have right behind Century Foods on? We have Marshall Middle School. We have Monroe Elementary, right? So we have to put them into a lockdown. Now, where's the threat on that? It's outside the building. We have ways of preventing people from getting in the building. We lock the doors. And do we want to cause panic? And the answer was no. We want to keep the kids in their familiar situation. We want them to continue on school. We have about an hour and a half left to school. Can we keep them there? Can we keep things going as normal and resolve this issue before school gets out? And uh, thankfully, we did. Um, but, you know, as the suspect moved throughout the community, now we've got him on the other side of Milwaukee Street. We're tracking him with a dog, and we think he's approaching Jefferson Elementary. And so we're, it's a constant uh, update of information, and, and we have to think on the fly, and we have to put other buildings into lockdown. So um, we practice it in the schools. Uh, we practice it with some daycare facilities, churches, and that. Um, and these sort of instances, it, it works, and it's worked well. Um, so again, this video can be used. It's available. You uh, go on YouTube and you type in Run, Hide, Fight, James. I think it was pretty well done. Um, the next portion of it, and I, like I said, it's a 17-minute video, so we're not going to sit and watch it all. The next portion is Run, Hide, Fight, what we've covered today. And those are your options, and how do we go about those options. So with that, um, hopefully, like I said, we've taken away um, some knowledge about some of these incidents that have happened in our community. Um, what we can do if we have an incident like this. Maybe it's uh, further spiked your interest in this and you can pass this on to maybe your church community or um, where you work. Uh, if you're involved, like you said, you're involved with the nonprofit, um, please, please ask us. That's what we're here for and we want to get as many people as we can educated in this. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate thank you. It.